Security and Risk Mapping the Contours of a Political Economy of Risk A 29-minute presentation held in the Allenbrook Lecture Theatre in the Joint Services Command Staff College, Shrivenham on the 14th of November 2007 The speaker is Dr Mark Shellhays Now, as you see, Security and Risk Mapping the Contours of Political Economy of Risk The reason I'm doing the talk on security and risk, there are two things, basically. My current research project I'm working on is essentially a comparison of the perception of risk and the use of risk within the military in comparison to the use of risk in um, the financial services industry. So essentially comparing two very different different actors, both under the framework um, of security. I will talk about that a little bit later. And the second one is that I wanted to talk about as well um, how risk has become well, an emerging theme, if you like, in security studies over the last three or four years. So essentially to talk a little bit about some of the approaches that are, uh, that are being developed, how to apply risk in the wider context of security studies, um, critical security studies, not just the risk society argument, but some of the other arguments um, as well. And then finally, talking about the political economy of risk to really link it to my, uh, my research framework at the very end and why I'm looking at those two and why it actually... So why it matters to the work we do here. So there will be four themes, basically. The first one I will talk about what I call here demystifying risk. So an introduction to the concept of risk. Because in many ways risk has become, as a term, overused in the same way as maybe globalization has become. So I want to talk a little bit about different approaches to how risk is understood. I will then link that very briefly to conceptualizing security for the purpose of the, uh, of the talk I'm giving. And then thinking about risk and security theory and practice. And in this part, I will um, talk about risk theory and security studies and then link it actually to one practical example, which is the um, controversial concept of the war on terror and how different approaches to risk actually can help us to understand different aspects of the war on terror and its implications better. So essentially this part really linked the theory to the practice and what we do here. And then fourthly, I will bring it all back in a conclusion um, security and risk in context, if you like, the political economy of risk. So let's start with risk, uncertainty and danger, some theoretical approaches to risk. And risk as a concept was really being used originally to talk about insurance. So when uh, particularly social insurance schemes were devised with the rise of the welfare state in, in the 19th century, the idea that you insure whole populations against um, health risks, for example, or against unemployment or insure them for retirement. Collective schemes to essentially spread the risk literally above large part of the population. So insurance as very early on. Now in the 1920s, Frank Knight introduced the distinction in economics between risk and uncertainty. And that is quite important because for him, risk then became a quantifiable entity. You could use risk, you can quantify risk in financial markets, stock movements, investment in funds, and so on. So risk became the quantifiable aspect of it, whereas uncertainty became the aspect that you could simply not predict the limits of quantity. So this distinction between risk and uncertainty was dominant in the risk discourse from the 1920s onwards towards the 1970s. So risk essentially becomes a calculable outcome, risk as probability. Uh, and that is very much as risk is still understood by most. So by the 1980s, we get to the sociological uh, take on on this. And here Beck's Risk Society, which you probably all heard of before, came out originally in 86 in German, and then this is the English translation in 92. So the Risk Society towards the new modernity. And what Beck's argument essentially was about, or is about risk, is that what we've witnessed is we moved from simply, for example, floods being taken as external events, as risks to countries or individuals, to risks that have actually been a result of our industrialization, or what he calls the second modernity, i.e. manufactured risks, which risks that we have created for ourselves. So risk then becomes really a way to organize societies. And in the 1990s then, we saw a rise in the risk discourse, essentially. So uh, using Beck's argument, for example, you can take um, environmental degradation, global warming and so on, are essentially a risk that has been caused by us, but it is essentially um, something that is is manufactured. And we then use 
um, that interpretation of the future, i.e. global warming will result in flooding and so on, to basically uh, design and implement policies for the present. So the precautionary aspect of this comes into risk, i.e. we have particular assumptions about the future, we cannot wait for the outcome, we have to deal with it in the present. And then you've seen, of course, then what I called here, power has called the risk management of everything uh, and the rise of the regulatory state. So from the late 1990s onwards, you see a spread in risk assessments, for example. If you um, are pregnant, your employer has to do risk assessment. If your children go on a school trip, there's a risk assessment and so on. So risk becomes the dominant form to, uh, to manage societies. We've seen the rise of different regulatory agencies, for example, in foods, in um, pharmaceuticals and so on. So regulation of risk, the expectation that the state manages risk in tandem with the liberalization of markets becomes a critical objective here. And that really links to the, the reflexive nature of risk. And here another, is also well known in risk terms, but less so than back uh, Luhmann with risk sociological theory. And he introduced two important distinctions, which is between risk and danger, and risk and security. And danger, essentially, is that what we perceive as external to our actions, i.e. risk. Um, we can create risk for ourselves. We take risks every day. But essentially, danger is something we perceive almost as a threat, essentially. So that's quite an important distinction. And also risk and security. So to use this dichotomy between uh, security equal safety and risk, of equalizing and security. The key is here, if you think about risk and danger and risk and security, that essentially these are constructed concepts, if you like. So you can identify something rightly or wrongly as a danger to see it externally, for example. You can treat terrorism, if you like, as a danger. Alternatively, you can actually uh, argue that you have caused some of it yourself, then it becomes a risk. And the, the key is here, again, the social construction of the concept. So we're moving away from a night's risk as a quantifiable entity to risk as a socially constructed concept. And risk then essentially becomes a tool to reflect our expectations of the future onto the present. And again, I used the example earlier about global warming, and that's precisely that case. We, can't, we don't know really what the effects of global warming will be. We don't even know how warm the Earth is. We have estimates, we have projections of the future. But essentially, we're using these objections to inform policy in the present. So essentially, this is how, how we're using then risk to shape our policies today. So in many ways, risk evaluation is context-bound, where then the context itself can become a further risk. So for example, if today, if you are in prison for murder, and you want to go on parole, you want to get out, you need a psychologist and a psychiatrist to make a risk assessment. Now, objectively, you would say this is a clear-cut case to professionals getting together and they make a risk assessment. But whatever assessment they make of you as a risk, they, of course, have to take into account the context in which they make that decision. So if they get their judgment wrong, it presents a risk to themselves. It presents a risk to their professional uh, judgment. So we've seen, for example, in the 1990s in court cases, professionals becoming important for the prosecution, but then also over recent years questioning that expertise. On what grounds has this expertise actually been made? So again, there is a reflection on, on the rise and the problems with risk. So in short then, the evaluation of risk, to quote Luhmann, is dependent on the present. Like the present, evaluation of risk can shift in the course of time. And like the present, it can reflect itself in the time horizons of the past and the future. And what he means with that is, is essentially that your, your individual risk assessment is very, very dependent on your own past and your own expectations of the future. For example, if you take house prices, if you bought a house in the 1980s and you experienced a crash in the 1990s, your assessment of the current situation, the current state of the housing market is very different from somebody who bought property in the late 1990s and has only experienced seven, eight, nine years of growth. So essentially there already, your expectations of the future differ fundamentally in many respects from somebody uh, who has a different experience and a different, again, expectation of the future. So that is sort of, in uh, very briefly, some of the thinking about how, how risk is then used sociologically if you like, and to sort of bring across the distinction between risk as a quantifiable entity versus risk essentially as a social construct.
Now, how is that then linked to security? And before I come to the concrete examples I'm going to use to sort of show why risk matters in security studies, first of all, what I understand by security. First of all, it is, of course, the widening and the deepening of the concept. And with the widening, in this Buzanian idea, simply to not just talk about military, but talk about societal, economic, environmental, political, and so on, but also the deepening of the concept of security. I, it's not just the state, it's supranational, it's subnational, it's individual, it's human security that does matter. And I will come back to that when I talk about the political economy and how it affects individual lives and individual behaviors. So essentially, security then essentially becomes a constructed concept similar to what I was talking about, construction of risk. And this is then essentially, security becomes, well, I'm interested in a critical self-reflection of security and its related practices in the contemporary security environment. And precisely this is security for who? What are we trying to secure? Whose security? What kind of security? And again, I will come back to that later. So that's very briefly conception of security. So now, to sort of get to the meat, if you like, thinking about risk and security. Why does risk matter in security studies? And I will start out with three, what I call the macro level, but three broad schools that I would say exist in security studies, how it can apply it theoretically, and then use, as I said earlier, a concrete example, the war on terror, to highlight that. Now, initially, you can say that, uh, firstly, risk entered security studies through the concept of insurance. And here, for example, in the case of police, as I put out there, the use of statistics and profiling to identify threats, patterns, and uh, patterns of criminal activity. So as such, the the language and the technologies of risk became a tool to identify, to categorize, to classify different uh, types of risks. So the use of risk in everyday routines by risk management practitioners and what Beagle calls professions of unease becomes an integral part of trying to deal with uncertainty and danger through risk. So essentially what it means is that the practices of risk, how people apply them, essentially becomes then come a way for them to sort of categorize uncertainties. The second one is the risk society thesis and, and the precautionary principle. According then to Beck, as I said earlier, risk has become the key characteristic of today's society in a sense that the defining principle of the second modernity. So society is characterized by risks and the consequences of these risks we cannot predict. And this could be climate change, nuclear technology, genetics, but also, of course, financial crises or terrorism. And financial crisis is a very good point to make because if you look at, for example, the Asian crisis in the 1990s, also the crisis in Russia, or even the recent crisis about the subprime mortgage market in the United States, these have not been predicted by any of the existing models that are designed to measure risk, to quantify risk. So credit rating agencies have not succeeded again in measuring in any shape or form risk. And again, the current debate about Northern Rock and everything related to it is a good way to sort of show how risk shifts over time, perceptions of risk shift. Six or eight months ago, Northern Rock, I think, got an award for uh, innovative financial uh, models. And now our understanding of risk has shifted, essentially. So we look at it in a very different way. So the key is that any attempt to calculate risk in this context is really doomed to failure as simply these risks cannot be calculated, they simply cannot be insured against. So as such, the precautionary principle is then applied to policy making um, in order to deal with the possibility of catastrophic events, for example, global warming. And the precautionary principle essentially comes out of environmental law, where simply the idea is it is not enough to wait for the outcome of something. You basically have to apply precaution and have your policy guided by that. As I said earlier, it's not enough to wait how far sea levels will rise in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time, we have to do something about it now. But essentially, we're talking about future events we are not sure about. And the third, a broad school in security studies, is risk as a disciplinary tool, if you like, to govern societies. Because the idea is basically that when we're faced with unpredictable risks at the limits of insurability, and you can take terrorism here as a very good example, You cannot quantify terrorism in traditional risk terms because there are not simply not enough terrorist events to develop a consistent pattern, if you like, to in any shape or form reliably predict 
uh, terrorist events, when they will happen, how they will happen. In contrast to, say, for example, your, your conventional household insurance, where, of course, insurers have enough information about patterns to do that. So essentially then, if you take, for example, terrorism as an example, risk is employed to break down uncertainty into manageable risk. And this then really, in, in turn, results in the creation of new systems to govern risks societies. So risk becomes a tool of governmentality, so a system to govern societies. And I will talk about that with the reflection on the war on terror. And then this really gives rise to the concept of um, precautionary risk, where risk then is used as a management tool to really deal with a spectrum of risks from everyday routines to catastrophic events. Now, how does this then actually matter as a practical case study and, for example, in what we study here when we look at security? And as I said, I want to use the the war on terror as a case study. And I will look at it, first of all, as a contentious concept from a risk society approach. First of all, if you look at it from a risk point of view, in relation to strategy, then, war in an age of risk can be understood essentially as risk management. We have actually moved away from, if you like, a Clausewitzian clear end state political objective to something where, for example, the war on terror uh, has evolved into an open-ended commitment with an end state that is not achievable. So similarly, the desire for security has been replaced by the management of risk under conditions of uncertainty. So, for example, when you take Rumsfeld's famous quote about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, this is precisely what we're talking about. And the problem then, of course, primarily become the unknown unknowns, which you have to eventually address. So risk, in that context, then, can understands war essentially as a risk management exercise that it has become. Secondly, another point in relation to strategy. Now, if, as a result of the focus on risk, states are increasingly applying the precautionary principle to policymaking and then, by extension, to war fighting, what are the actual consequences? So increasingly, you can argue that preemption or anticipatory defense are employed to deal with risks that might or might not arise. And the case of Iran, again, is, is a good thing. It's essentially a judgment. You have to balance different risks. You have to balance the risk of Iran weaponizing its nuclear weapons program against the risk to global oil supplies and potentially inflationary pressure, which will affect interest rates, which will uh, affect all of us essentially, the mortgage we pay, or whatever. So you have to balance a complex range of different risks. But essentially, if you apply risk thinking to strategy making, then things like preemption or anticipatory defense become a real possibility, because then you link it back to war as risk management. Essentially, again, in the case of Iran, you're trying to deal with something that has not yet happened, yet that you assume might happen. And that is the key problem. And if this then guides policy, it, of course, can simply uh, result in the fact that your own prediction then eventually, of course, become reality. So there are problems in that. And then thirdly, in an age of risk and dangers, how do we actually balance commitment exemplified by risk and danger with available resources? So what effect does risk-based decision-making have on defense policy in general and on defense procurement in particular? So if you read, uh, for example, the concept paper of the Future Trends paper, and you see all the the wide range of of possible options, and then we have to sort of narrow it down and and think about, okay, what are actually the implications for defense procurement? What are the risks we have to to address, we have to prepare the forces for, we have to procure for, that come into it? So that is one aspect conceptually as well that becomes important. And of course then within that even you get then different risk analysis within defense procurement. But that would be a risk society approach to the war on terror. Now the other one I want to sort of contrast with is risk management as practice. So essentially risk as governmentality. And one example um, I think is very useful for that is the U.S. visit program. So if you uh, visited the United States over the last few years, of course, you know, your fingerprints have been taken, your picture has been taken, your passport has been scanned. And essentially, out of this information, before you even left Heathrow, as an example, all your data, how you booked your flight, with what you paid, where you live, your phone number, and so on, has been cross-referenced with uh, even before you left the United Kingdom. 
with different databases in the US and elsewhere. So in that sense, this really becomes an example of everyday practice, again, in the context of the war on terror. Now, if you take the US visit program, it's designed to classify visitors um, entering the US according to this profile. And this is, of course, not new. It has existed since the um, the 1970s, uh, with computing capacities increasing. But essentially, these profiles will either allow a person an expedited entry into the country or result in a visitor facing greater scrutiny at the border. Now, similar systems are, of course, increasingly being rolled out globally. And in a sense, through America requiring these systems, we all, uh, at some point, had to sign up to them in order to, for us to be able to actually travel to the United States. So simply resisting these measures wouldn't have really help us. So essentially what these systems present is then really an accumulation of knowledge, where really knowledge becomes key in managing those risks. It's, as I said, the information that you have to provide and that others provide about you that then allows you to be either classified as a risk or not. And the result of this, in practical terms, is essentially increasing levels of surveillance. And this is not just for the traveller, this is of course also in relation to money transfers and travel patterns. How often have you travelled and where have you, what countries have you visited? So essentially, again, going back to the idea of precautionary risk. Now to put this into context, this emphasis has actually shifted in this case from investigating a crime that has been committed, i.e., for example, the most terrorists have committed a terrorist act, to predicting that crime and identifying the criminal or the terrorist in this case before the crime has actually been committed. And this is quite an important change. And we've seen it in other government policies as well. If, for example, the government now wants to approach eight or nine-year-old children in their families based on patterns and profiling that might end up in prison in their 20s. So this is another way of how we project risk directly onto policymaking. However, the example here raises then two questions, really. First of all, to what extent is actually the data you gather and the data you compare with based on profiling, data mining, biometrics, and so on, accumulated and cross-referenced, is it actually reliable? And we've seen these problems in terms of money transfers. Now, money transfers, terrorists were classified as, for example, small amounts of money that are being transferred between particular countries. And in the net, in the profile, if you like, we then, of course, caught up a lot of immigrants who regularly send small amounts of money abroad. So there are issues with profiling. And, of course, if you know about the profiles, it's very easy to, in a sense, evade them. And we've seen that with the early profiling done in the, particularly in the 1980s, where the very groups you targeted, in that case left-wing terrorists in Germany, became uh, basically, essentially, learned to evade and to deal with the profiling and simply do not behave as the profile expected. So there are issues there. The other problem, of course, is also uh, to what extent is this actually desirable? So the quest for ever more knowledge, really, about individuals, about their movements and actions in order to manage risk and minimize uncertainty potentially extends profiling to entire populations. And the identity scout scheme, which is being planned here, is a case in point. Essentially, what you do is you turn a whole country into suspects and say, you have to prove to us that you're not a risk. And in that sense, it becomes very different. And of course, the logic then, again, in this, what some people call politics of fear, is to actually say, well, as long as you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to worry about. But of course, that goes back to what I said earlier about whose security are we talking about? How much information do we want the government or anybody else to hold about that? So what are really the effects of surveillance or what some people call data valence in terms of desirability and in terms of the security we want to provide. Now then sort of to, uh, to bring it to a conclusion then, security and risk in context, the political economy of risk. Now, conceptually, the global political economy is central to the conception of risk in security studies. So for example, in relation to the risk society argument, globalization exacerbates risks such as terrorism and financial crisis and turns them into truly global risks, the uh, consequences of which are impossible to predict. And this really then emphasizes uncertainty. Now, of course, for the governmentality approach, the need to sustain globalization as the principal driving force for economic growth and economic development for key global actors, in that sense, risk becomes a useful tool to do just that. Because, of course, one of the challenges after 9-11 was how can we actually control money transfer? How can we control the movement of people? How can we cross-reference while at the same time not substantially 
harming the positive economic, positive effects of globalization and global economic trade, because that, of course, was a very real problem when we talk about the surveillance um, of financial markets. So in that sense, surveillance and prevention systems centers on risk profiles and risk management systems enable the banking system, for example, to continue to operate with a minimum of disruption while at the same time allowing the relevant authorities to monitor financial transactions. So in that sense, risk then, as governmentality, attempts to deal with the consequences and uncertainties of globalization and of the uncertainties of globalization. So to bring it then together, in terms of the, the research I'm doing on risk and security in the political economy of risk, this is how essentially risk, political economy and security interrelate. And it goes back to the very beginning of like constant security. If you talk about human security, all this matters. It's the security of your mortgage, of your savings, security of state, financial system, if you like, the economic well-being of the country, economic stability of the region, the global financial system. And in that sense, as a result of globalization and of us becoming increasingly interlinked, risk and how we deal with it essentially matters. In that sense, it's also linked to a um, wider context of security studies. And as I said, it raises, as I think I've shown in the one case study, in two approaches to the one case study, quite a set of relevant and important questions in how we deal with some of the new security challenges we're talking about once we frame them in the context of risk and once we employ instruments that are designed to deal with risk. Dr. Shellhays was asked the following question. Would you agree that because business is receptive to immediate demands and fast to respond... It can calculate risk within the context of a reasonable time frame. But for state organisations such as Defence, the machinery for the accumulation and processing of data and equipment procurement takes such a long period of time that the context of risk can change substantially. I think it's useful as a tool to, if I said earlier, if you conceptualise future trends, for example, and you can frame them in a risk discourse. I think the problem is, and that's why I talk briefly about rating agencies, for example, where even in business, and I mean, if you look at the, the Asian financial crisis in the mid-1960s, 96, 97, that's not that long ago, and rating agencies didn't do very well out of that because, you know, they simply didn't predict the credit risk. And very recently, the same, of course, to the, to the subprime mortgage market, hedge funds, pressure again, rating agencies have been accused of not predicting the future based on relatively short-term assessments. So I think the problem is with using risk in, even in the short-term financial sense in a, as a quantifiable entity is that you're dealing with essentially political economy questions. So it's not just if you apply for a loan and you simply look at you know, how, how well you paid back previous loans, for example, you know, so a bank, in that sense, is a much more manageable individual risk. But if we look at those effects and we bring in the political aspects into it, that makes it um, a, lot more, a lot more difficult. Where you can link it to procurement, I suppose, is in especially because we look at these long-term projects, 20, 25 years in the future, the time, you know, the same year a fighter comes into service, already we're talking about next generation and even that sort of conceptually being obsolete. Well, if we use that then to sort of reflect on future scenarios, it becomes a useful tool. Dr. Shellhays can be contacted by email at m.shellhays, spelt Sierra Charlie Hotel Echo Lima Hotel Alpha Sierra Echo, at mgc, that's Mike Golf Charlie, dot com.